So as Miller mentioned, I'll be talking about how we recommend managing diabetes and where a low-carb diet might actually fit in with that or not. So basically before we even get into low carbohydrate, there's a difference in what low carb means to different people. Now low carb sometimes refers to, and this might be in studies and research, or it might be when you read on the internet or what you read in the paper or what you see on social media. Carbohydrates can be referred to as a percentage of the total energy that you eat. So usually a low carb diet is around 40% of energy coming from carbohydrate. It can be a set level, so it could be 130 grams, 80 grams, whatever that person chose to define as low carb. Or it can be a ketogenic diet, which is usually referred to as less than 50 grams of carbohydrate per day. Now when we look at the evidence in type 2 diabetes, there's been eight main studies that have compared a low carb diet, whatever that was, to a higher carb diet. Now, within those studies, those studies actually ranged anywhere between 20 grams of carbohydrate a day up to 166 grams of carbohydrate a day. And some of those studies were designed for people to lose weight, so they were quite low in energy. And those studies ranged anywhere between six months to two years. Now, over the course of those studies, people did often lose weight, anywhere between 2 kilos and up to 12 kilos in some studies. Now, I talk about this weight loss before I talk about the effect on glucose control, because we know that losing weight affects what your blood glucose levels do. And by losing weight, we can improve diabetes management. Now, when you actually get into the effect on glucose, three of those studies out of the eight showed improvements in glucose control as measured by HbA1c in low-carb diets compared to those higher-carb diets. Some studies showed no difference between the higher-carb and the lower-carb intake, but the people who were on the lower-carb intake had less medications. So there was a little bit of a benefit there, even though the glucose levels overall were not actually different. So there does seem to be a little bit of a benefit from a lower-carb intake. But the interesting thing was it didn't matter what kind of low-carb diet it was, whether it was a 20 grams or it was an upper end, which was 166 grams a day. They didn't seem to show much difference whether it improved or didn't. There were two studies that looked at a low-carb diet for people with type 1 diabetes. Now, in those studies, the two, both of them were set at 75 grams a day of carbohydrate, and both of those studies showed improvement in glucose levels. However, these studies were only done in a maximum total of 58 people. And in the study that was larger, only about 50% of people on the low-carb intake could actually stick with that 75 grams a day limit. And when they analysed the results, they only actually looked at those people who did follow the diet versus those who didn't. So it's great for those for whom can follow the diet, but for those who can't, quite clearly it doesn't work. Now, given that this is only in 58 people and they're two small studies, we really wouldn't be able to extrapolate that to all of the people out there who have type 1 diabetes. So this is definitely an area where we need a bit more research and evidence. Now, the other thing that's worth talking about is we talk about these diets and these studies as if they apply to everyone. Because we talk about you know, an improvement in blood glucose control or a weight loss of 4 kilos or 2 kilos or 12 kilos. But that's not everyone who participated in the study. So, this point works. Good. These two diets at the top here are both lower carbohydrate diets. The two at the bottom are high carbohydrate diets. And you can see that some people, they lose quite a lot of weight on the low carb diet, but some people gain weight. And it's exactly the same with a higher carbohydrate diet. So there are some people that respond to low carb and some people who are worse off when it comes to weight management. And of course that influences diabetes management. So there's definitely no one size fits all approach when it comes to different types of diets. So with that bit of background, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we actually recommend people eat. And before I get into that, I'm going to get you to have a little read through this uh, cartoon. This is something that I found in one of the Sunday papers about eight years ago. And it's as true now as it was then, and it will probably be true for the next 20 or 50 years or however long we're talking about different types of diets. 
So when we talk about diets, a lot of the time we're talking about nutrients. And people don't eat nutrients. They don't talk, eat just gluten, or they don't eat just carbs, or they don't eat fat or sugar, whatever it is we want to say is bad and people shouldn't have. We eat food. And that food contains different nutrients. Now this is the Australian Guide to Diet. The Australian Guide to Healthy Eating. It's the Australian Dietary Guideline representation. And I know this cops a lot of slack, but I'm a dietitian and I love it, so I'm going to talk about it. Now, when we talk about these sorts of foods, when we're looking at diabetes management, which is my area of expertise, we're talking about trying to have moderate amounts of carbohydrate foods, which is all of these. And we're very particular about things like glycemic index, and lower GI options being the better choices for people with diabetes. Now, some of you would have seen um, on, in the entrance on the way through that um, we've got a couple of um, resources that our department has put together about healthy eating. This one is our gluten-free shopper's guide. There's also a standard shopper's guide. And they're put out there because we know that a lot of people know roughly the sort of healthy food they should be eating, but they've got no idea what to buy when they go to the supermarket. Because most of the time when we buy foods, we buy foods in packages, and we don't often just focus on these whole foods which we probably should a little bit more, but we know that it can be challenging for a lot of people. So we've got these guys out there in terms of helping people to choose those better products that are available. If you're someone who needs to follow a gluten-free diet, and we know a lot of people with diabetes, particularly type 1 diabetes, a lot of those people also have celiac disease, so they have to have a gluten-free diet. There are gluten-free options within all of these foods. If you're a person who needs a low FODMAP diet, and we see quite a lot of people who have diabetes and also have an irritable bowel and may benefit, maybe some of those people who benefit from a low FODMAP intake, there are lower FODMAP options in all of these food groups. So definitely we can work within these guidelines to make sure people are having that healthy balanced diet that we want them to be having. Now, if you were to exclude all carbohydrates from your diet, which is all of those red and cereal foods, those starchy vegetables, fruit, milk and yogurt, and lentils, legumes, chickpeas, and some legume foods, you're not left with a lot. And so that's a lot of the reason why those low carbohydrate diets can be very restrictive and very difficult to follow. We were touched on before that there are some negative consequences of low carb diets. So I spoke before about there being some of these positive effects on diabetes management and blood glucose control, and that's great. But we also have to think first do no harm. So if people might benefit from a little less carbohydrate in their diet, what potential negative effects could there be? So when people are cutting out all that carbohydrate, what are they replacing it with? And we've talked a little bit about we would reduce a lot of our fibre intake and that can have impacts on sort of gut health, risk of colon cancer, particularly if it's concurrent with people increasing their meat intake, particularly red meat and highly processed red meats. There's um, a risk of people who cut out their um, milk and dairy and miss out on a lot of calcium. And also there's very low ketogenic type, carb, low carb diets. There seems to be an increase in the risk of bone loss because keto acidosis, or the acidosis that come from ketones can actually further exacerbate bone loss. So we might be increasing people's risk of osteoporosis. And also, particularly for people with diabetes, one of the problems is kidney damage, and high protein diets can also impact on kidney health. So we don't want to be making people's kidneys worse off if we're giving them low carb. The other thing that we need to talk about is people who are vegetarian. So if they're choosing not to eat a lot of these animal meat products, they don't have a lot left that they can eat, particularly if they're going low carb and they're missing out on a lot of those carbohydrate containing veg vegetable protein sources. So it can be really, really tricky. Now, when looking at the Australian Dietary Guidelines for the average Australian adult, of course it varies by age and by gender, but when we talk a little bit about these grain and cereal foods, because that's our main source of carbohydrate foods, the actual guidelines are six serves a day. Now that sounds like a lot, six times a day I've got to be eating carbs. It's actually not that much food. So that's one slice of bread. Now I know you just chose two, but it's one. It's half a cup of cooked pastoral rice. It's half a cup of porridge. 
It could be half a cup of quinoa or amaranth if you're going gluten free. So there's a lot of fish, a lot of carbohydrates that people overconsume because they're not aware of what those portion sizes are and what we actually should be eating. This is one of our resources. So again, it was picked up um, at the front. If you grabbed a copy, they're also available on our website. And this is our plate model resource, which again shows you a little bit more about in a meal format what sort of portions of foods we're actually recommending for people with diabetes. Now, that's around two serves out of your six of carbohydrate foods, roughly speaking. So it's that kind of pasta, so it's a little bit more. They differ slightly to the Australian Dietary Guidelines because they focus a little bit more specifically on carbohydrates and diabetes management. But it's by no means a lot of carbohydrates, but it's also not cutting carbohydrates out altogether. It's moderate amounts of lean protein foods, and it's this bit which almost none of us do, about 6% of Australian adults actually get adequate serves of vegetables in. So if there's anything you take home today, it's, it's this stuff. It's carb free, it's gluten free, it's great. <laughs> so if you were actually going to do, oops, we'll just go back. If you wanted to do low carb, and this is much more of a image of someone doing that 40% of energy moderate carbohydrate restriction. Eat plenty of vegetables, but maybe a little bit of potato, have lean protein foods, have low fat dairy options, have healthy fats from nuts, from sources like avocado and extra virgin olive oil, those unsaturated fats that Neil was speaking about earlier, have a little bit of fruit, and have a little bit of those whole grain, unprocessed where possible, carbohydrate foods. If you wanted to do something that was a little bit more keto, so it's very low carbohydrate, you'd still want to be having lots of those vegetables, you want to have, again, those lean protein sources, but not crazy amounts, not trying to have too much of those. You might go for something like sardines to get a little bit more calcium in because you're restricting your dairy foods. You'd still want to have those unsaturated healthy fats, but maybe some of those lower carb fruits rather than the high carb ones. And of course, we're excluding grains and cereal products. We don't want it to look like this which is much more of that Aitken's kind of style, used to the low carb diets used to look like, which a lot of high fat meats, a lot of high fat um, dairy, high salt processed foods, a lot of carb free sort of processed stuff, and not much of those unprocessed, healthy vegetable type foods. Thank you.